feelings Nothing more than feelings Trying to forget my Feelings of love Well before the Great Schism, Pope St. Gregory the Great wrote, He that has abundance, let him quicken himself to mercy and generosity. In this video we'll discuss Tsar Nicholas II, a man who clearly had great abundance, but during the pivotal year of 1905, he failed to show much mercy or generosity. First, let's discuss his abundance. Nicholas II amassed a personal fortune equivalent to $300 billion. This would have made him significantly richer than either Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. So yes, he had an astonishingly great abundance. Question, is it a sin to want to be rich? Answer, in itself it is not against the moral law. There are many dangers, however, connected with this desire for wealth. Our Savior warns us against this time and again. For instance, scripture says, And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Also, scripture tells us that, for the desire of money is the root of all evils. We can't read Nicholas's heart as to whether he desired and loved money, but we can say with confidence that he didn't have much interest in sharing it with any of his people. This video will concentrate on the events of 1905 which began with Russia being entangled in an adventurous and disastrous war with Japan. The Russian army and navy encountered humiliating defeat after defeat at the hands of the Japanese. The war in the east only exacerbated feelings of frustration back home. Disaffected soldiers returning from the bloody and disgraceful defeat at the hands of Japan returned home only to find inadequate factory pay and shortages. Peasants were assigned allotted land, which they weren't even allowed to sell. They found that the plots of land that they had were too small to even make a subsistence living. Hungry peasants roaming the countryside sometimes had to walk hundreds of miles just to find work. But life in the cities was no better. Industrial workers worked an average of 11-hour days. Jobs were grueling and factory conditions were often unsafe. Russian industrial workers were the lowest paid workers in all of Europe. Increased unhappiness with the Tsar's dictatorship was shown through industrial strikes and protests for better wages and working conditions. The emerging industrial working class resented the Tsar's government for doing too little to protect them. The Tsar's government had banned strikes and labor unions. Long before 1905, Pope Leo XIII declared that the role of the state is to promote justice through the protection of rights. He taught that the church must speak out on social issues to teach correct social principles and to ensure class harmony and to calm class conflict. So in 1905, Nicholas II should have stepped in to protect his people. As Pope Leo wrote, Whenever the general interest of any particular class suffers or is threatened with harm, which can in no other way be met or prevented, the public authority must step in and deal with it. If employers laid burdens upon their working men, which were unjust, or degraded them with conditions repugnant to their dignity as human beings, if health were endangered by excessive labor, in such cases there can be no question but that, within certain limits, it would be right to invoke the aid and authority of law. Unfortunately, Nicholas did the opposite of all of this. I should point out that this channel believes that a benevolent Catholic monarchy is the ideal form of government. However, Nicholas was neither Catholic nor benevolent. The defining moment of Nicholas's reign was January 22, 1905, which became known as Bloody Sunday. It was on this day that Nicholas squandered the loyalty of most of his people. An Orthodox priest named Georgi Gapone led a huge crowd of peaceful workers in a procession to the Winter Palace to present a petition to the Tsar. The troops guarding the palace were ordered not to allow demonstrators to pass a certain point. When they did, the Tsar's troops opened fire on the demonstrators, and they caused up to 1,000 deaths. The Sioux City Journal called it the slaughter of the innocents. It said that women and children and men of all ages were shot down in the streets of St. Petersburg. This illustration from the Chicago Tribune said that the spirit of the first of the Romanovs, Ivan the Terrible, was what inspired Nicholas to order the Cossacks to shoot to kill. The New Orleans Times and Democrat points out that the Tsar's reaction to his subjects' pleas for justice 
is what radicalized his nation. The events in St. Petersburg provoked public indignation and horror all around the world, as witnessed by political cartoons used in this video. This cartoon demonstrates how the Tsar's ruthlessness caused him to fall in the estimation of his people. Earlier, he had been venerated and called the Little Father. Three days after Bloody Sunday, in Lithuania, 130 protesters were killed by soldiers. And in a few days after that, in Warsaw, over 100 strikers were shot in the streets. Please recall that in 1905, both of these places were within the Russian Empire. A series of massive strikes spread throughout the industrial centers of Russia. Half of European Russia's industrial workers went on strike in 1905. In Poland, the percentage was over 90%. By April, a strike by railway workers essentially shut down the country. Interestingly, though Nicholas had banned labor unions, three Catholic popes had affirmed the right of working people to form unions. So what should a benevolent Christian monarch have done in the face of such unrest? Pope Pius XI later wrote that strikes and lockouts are forbidden. However, it was the Tsar's responsibility not to suppress the strikes, but to intervene and attempt to resolve the demands of his people in a just manner. He failed to do so, and that suggests he was not even a good or even adequate monarch. Though he had autocratic control over how things worked, he did nothing to ensure that labor and capital cooperated. And that wasn't the worst of it. There were also naval mutinies in multiple ports, peaking in June with a mutiny aboard the battleship Potemkin. The mutineers eventually surrendered the battleship to Romanian authorities on July 8th. Some sources claim that over 2,000 sailors were killed in the suppression. Here is a drawing from October of 1905. It shows the authorities cleaning dead bodies off of the streets in Odessa after a massacre. This cartoon in the Philadelphia Inquirer seems to correctly prophesize that the Tsar's actions were bringing about the beginning of his own end. Between December 5th and 7th, there was a general strike by Russian workers in Moscow. The government sent troops and used artillery to break up the demonstrations in the Shell Workers' Districts. On December 18th, with about a thousand people dead and parts of the city in ruins, the workers finally surrendered. Throughout Russia, there was a large number of atrocities and summary executions. By April of 1906, about 13 to 14,000 people had been executed and 75,000 had been imprisoned. Finally, the Tsar was backed into a corner, so he came out and promised some reforms. However, they were of little substance, and Russia didn't see any real reform. Much of what was promised, such as the Duma, had consulting powers only, and then the Duma was taken away in short order. When people realized that they had been duped, it only fanned their anger. Many, if not most historians, contend that the events of 1905 set the stage for the 1917 Russian Revolution. It was clear to observers, even in 1905, that the Tsar's response to Bloody Sunday would be his own undoing. Nowadays, there are people who look back at the Tsar nostalgically and picture him as a victim of the Bolsheviks. But in a very real way, the false promises of the Tsar fed the radicalization that culminated in the revolution of 1917 and his own execution. So why am I even talking about Nicholas II? It's because the Orthodox made him a saint. And I certainly understand the feelings behind that. There is no doubt that Nicholas was heads and shoulders better than the godless brutes and thugs that came after him. However, did he have heroic virtue? Some might contend that he died for his faith, but there's less evidence for that than to say that Father Georgi Gapon died for his faith. Throughout this playlist, I've emphasized the similarity between the Orthodox and the Novus Ordo churches. Like the Orthodox Church, the Novus Ordo Church has canonized many sketchy saints. And I could compare the desire to glorify Nicholas, who was much better than what came after him, to the current cause for Pope Pius XII, who was clearly better than anyone who came after him. But does possessing the quality of just being better than the worst of the worst qualify someone for sainthood? Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll be back again within a week with another one. But in the meantime, please check out my Facebook page and my Twitter page. Every day I post additional content that you won't find on this YouTube channel. And also, please pray for the church.